So I'm Joachim Landeberg. I was a reporter from the meeting talking about the spatial data, uh, and Aviv uh, was leading this. And I must say, we had a fantastic time. Yeah, we had a great time. Great time. So I thought of just shooting this off with some introductory notes, what is spatial, uh, to give a context of the context. Um, and the idea is obviously the human cell atlas, we want to aim for building an atlas, and an atlas is based on maps. So going from a Google view of it down to the tissue and down to the uh, tissue cells and types. And we try to span all of that within this discussion, which was uh, very broad. And I just made a, a uh, I went into the report from the London meeting, what it said about spatial technologies, and that was some nine months ago. It said obtaining spatial information is critical, but this may not be done from day one, but should be done before the draft is finished, where the methods are ready, uh, get the spatial information. So this is kind of implying that this is a community of technologies and computational biologists that's still developing technologies, and I think that reflected our discussion, because we have a number of different technologies with different uh, issues. So this image was presented by Sarah yesterday, which is really a survey of the spatial technologies. It's not complete, but it kind of indicates the parameters and things that we have to consider going to the spatial context. So uh, this graph demonstrates the genome-wide thinking of using those type of methods as compared to the more targeted uh, strategies. So in this discussion, we had to try to find common ground in the different aspects of these technologies. So you will see by this image that we do truly have genome-wide technologies today that is really could base and use much of the knowledge within the single cell RNA sec. And then you have the high resolution uh, incitement technologies that are working with panels with a highly, very high sensitivity. So I could just try to stratify this um, into three steps. Imaging uh, that we discussed, the detection, uh, not that much, just to uh, uh, make certain that we have all the omics in place, and the computational side, obviously. Um, in, t in terms of imaging, this is a new challenge for, for the molecular biologists to grasp that type of technology, and there's been quite a bit of work on that side. Uh, and that was brought up in this discussion. Uh, on the computational side, which I'll come back to later on, is, is really how can we treat the image and how can we merge the genetic data or the transcript data or the antibody data onto that scaffold. So we kind of made a, a, a well, this is actually a Aviv's image from how different methods are really uh, used today. One is by taking a tissue, greeting that or barcoding that to spatial domains. Uh, you have uh, on, on the right side the direct measurements in situ uh, using the murfish and seekfish. Uh, another protein assays also in the spatial context and also the sequencing by FISEC and the Nielsen method, right? <laughs> so as you just by looking at, and then on top of that we have the, the which we believe is, is important, the inf inference combining methods into a context. So this is a long introduction in a way, but this is just to pinpoint that the technologies that are underlying the computational side is very, very different and has different advantages and also possibilities when we try to go into the challenges. So uh, this was really uh, the points that we thought of discussing uh, from the pre-processing pipelines to the common coordinated framework, again, you have to consider the different methods here, and then projecting cells to tissue. We really didn't get into that aspect as much as we wanted to, uh, but we talked about data sets and experimental designs. These were the most immediate things for the spatial group, I would say, but obviously the goal of this is to be able to identify cells um, and, and using the neighborhood of cells in, in that definition, right? Something that we also brought up, obviously, is the histology. How far have we come with the uh, methods that are around today? And how much can we anticipate to be this? 
And we also made an, a comment to how these technologies go in, towards the uh, development of biology. So actually, this number of these points were intermingled in, during this discussion, I would say, but we spend a lot of time just on the pre-processing pipelines, uh, as they are very different, and we don't really have a common uh, framework for that. Um, do you want to add something on the pre-processing? Uh, I'll add on the pre-processing pipeline that um, there was a lively discussion on the need for several things, the need for um, validation or ground truth or gold standards, and that there is quite a lot of information because spatial information has been collected for the past 150 or more years. Actually, if you go back to the development of the microscope, you have to go back to the 1600s. Um, so there is a lot of fiduciary information by which we can compare, and that's needed and it needs to be taken into consideration. That there is the need for using uh, computational methods, both ones that are more model-driven and ones that are more based on uh, machine learning with some maybe supervision um, to some extent, and that there is a lot of effort on segmenting cells, but that it might also be important and useful not to have perfect, not to wait for perfect cell segmentation before doing some other things. That it's important to figure out cell segmentation, but we might be able to work with data that's less than perfect in terms of cell segmentation for some of the questions. That it is important to have software because there isn't as much right now and to have data that's available because there isn't that much right now. We could come back to that later on. Um, and the fact that there are many different techniques and maybe measuring with multiple techniques will help with the pre-processing, but there are also a lot of specific pre-processing that has to happen uh, for each individual technique in its own right. Some of them, some things can be very difficult for one technique and easy for another, and vice versa, or just difficult in different ways for uh, different techniques. I think mm -hmm. those were the key points around pre-processing. We did spend a lot of time on that, and that very much reflected the fact that it's, a, it's the roadblock. If you can't pre-process the data, there's really no downstream from there. So mm -hmm. everyone is worried about that. So then we come into the uh, definition or the learning of a common coordinate framework. Working with tissue, we need to have a framework to be able to compare between different labs, uh, but also within the between patients or individuals and also within a, a tissue organ. And that is really underdeveloped, uh, I would say. Uh, the, the, the landmark work has been done by the Alan Brain Atlas uh, project that has been doing these kind of uh, uh, coordinated uh, frameworks for the mouse brain. Uh, and that has been then done to avoid genetic variation uh, and, and uh, using inbred uh, mouse. And possibly that is something that, that we, will be hard to, to replace using human tissues, although there are a number of things that we can learn from that process. Um, but I think this is a really an area that where we have to do much more development as the human cell atlas progress. Do you want to say something more on that? We heard uh, two interesting things. Um, in addition, first of all, that for gross anatomical structures, there's a lot that was learned in the MRI community over the years, and that's why we could probably feel comfortable there, but we have to engage with that community, I would say. I don't think there was an MRI person in the room. That's my summary. And there was an excellent set of uh, comments from an astrophysicist, either a former astrophysicist or current astrophysicist. I wasn't certain about that about how to do nesting in coordinate frameworks and how to work with multiple maps that are nested one with another. And again, it highlights a community for us in astronomy and astrophysics that could be extremely uh, valuable for the cartographers of the cell atlas to uh, engage with. And that in histology, because of digital, and that was also in the context of segmentation and pre-processing, that because of digital pathology for histology purposes, which is a very vibrant field right now, everyone in the room that has experience in that and approaches from deep learning and other areas of machine learning felt that that would be comfortably addressable. And all I said actually in that context was to quote Ed Lane, who's from the Allen Institute, but wasn't, he's not in the meeting now, 
but who said that it's kind of the piece in the middle that's very difficult. No one had a solution on the spot for the difficult piece, but that in the histolo histological level, it's probably okay. In the gross anatomical level, we can probably figure it out because people have already. And in the middle, it's a little bit unclear what we need to map there and in what way, and that this is a great area to try and learn and maybe use molecular information to do the mapping better. Mm -hmm. And then we came to the subject of, of uh, projecting cell statistics, which is super interesting, obviously. But we kind of concluded, I would say, that there are so many methods out there and they are truly com uh, com uh, complementary, that we could actually take advantage of the single cell, uh, single cell data in the context of the tissue to validate anything that is found. And on the inside to stuff, we have the sensitivity and we have the single cell resolution. And on top of that, we could also have uh, whole genome-wide studies. So the combination of that will aid us to develop the algorithms and to find signatures of the cell types. I see we have one person standing here. Uh, yes, so, so the data sets are experimental. So we kind of concluded that there are so many things out there that we need to try to consolidate, cons well, consolidate, well, whatever, you understand what I'm saying. Um, because we have to have more data sets available for the computational community to develop and also to make these inference studies uh, on data sets that are common to multiple platforms. And I think that's a very important take home message is that we have to coordinate ourselves better to be able to address the spatial context with these technologies. Questions? Questions? So, since I think it's valuable to tell this audience, what is uh, the conclusion of the uh, benchmark data set that we thought of? Okay, so there was a long wish list. I'll try to reconstruct from memory. Mm -hmm. uh, we told the audience that they can come up with everything, anything they wanted. <laughs> so, um, it was to have a data set from maybe three to five tissues that are different from each other, meaning, you know, maybe you would have the brain and maybe you would have something like an epithelium and maybe a lymph node. I don't know. That I'm inventing now. Um, so maybe three to five tissues like that, at least three specimens from three different individuals. We said all the spatial methods that are out there, no one exactly knows exactly what will come up in the next two months in, any, in, in this rapidly evolving field, but at least the key ones in these three areas that, we, uh, that, that were described. And um, the data all available online, both in pre-processed form, based on the current standards for processing any particular data set, and in raw form, for those who want to delve into the pre-processing in an appropriate data platform that they can access it in, and the ability then to try and compute on it and um, see what, what the community can come up with. Um, it seems from initial discussions with at least the key method developers that there was some receptiveness to the idea of doing a small number of specimen on a small num specimens on a small number of tissues yeah. for this purpose. Yeah.